Good morning, everyone. We're having some technical difficulties with our YouTube channel, but uh, we've decided to go ahead um, and uh, hopefully the technical problems will be resolved very soon. October, October 7th, um, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, for the record, my name is Liz Braden, District 9 City Councillor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Redistricting. I am joined by my colleagues, Councillor President Flynn, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Baker, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Louis Jean, Councillor Bach, and my uh, coach, my uh, vice chair, uh, Councillor Worrell. This working session is being recorded. It will be live streamed at boston.gov backslash city council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity channel eight, RCN channel 82 and Fios channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.redistricting at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available for all councillors. Since this is a working session, there will not be any public comment period. Today's uh, working session is on docket 10898, order for the adoption of City Council redistricting principles, dockets 1186, 1215, and 1216, an ordinance amending City Council electoral districts. Um, so there are printed materials for each councillor at your desk. For those watching the live stream or the recording of this working session, the materials are available at boston.gov backslash redistricting. Maps for dockets 1186, 1215 and 1216. A table of precinct changes across all proposed maps. Distinct demographic data for docket 1186, highlighted in yellow. Distinct, pre, precinct, sorry, not distinct. Precinct demographic, demographic data for docket 1215, highlighted in green. Precinct demographic data for docket 1216. And current demographic data, blue and green tables. Uh, baseline district demographic data purple and pink tables, a US Department of Justice guidance under section two of the Voting Rights Act for redistricting and methods for electing government bodies. Digital copies of the presentation slides are being emailed to councillors and are being posted on the committee website. Each councillor will have 20 to 30 minutes to present their proposed redistricting plan. The recorded link will make available the sh and share all uh, with members of the public to review and familiarize themselves with proposals prior to testifying at upcoming hearings. As of now, the schedule is on Tuesday next, October 11th at 5 p.m. in the Ionella Chamber. A committee meeting will receive public testimony. Please help spread the word. And, following, and the following Monday, October 17th, at the, af at the afternoon or evening, a public hearing in the Ionella Chamber or at an off-site location. Thursday, October 20th, in the evening, a public hearing off-site in Fields Corner. The venue will, has yet to be confirmed, but hopefully we'll be able to confirm a venue very soon. Friday, October 21st, in the morning, a committee working session. Monday, October 24th, morning committee working session, uh, Monday 24th afternoon or evening public hearing, and Tuesday October 25th morning working session, and Wednesday October 26th target council meeting for possible action. Uh, I'd ask my colleagues to help us uh, if there are community members, advocates and leaders who we should invite to a working session to speak more directly and intimately with the committee than, than at a hearing. And brief, uh, brief overview of docket 1098, uh, uh, order for the adoption of redistricting principles. Uh, that's the, the principles that Rout led uh, um, at August, in our August meeting. Uh, how do councillors feel about the current language as amended? Are there further additions or revisions that we feel necessary to the redistricting principles that we have laid out? 
and would it be possible to vote on that docket on October 15th, uh, the Fogger, uh, October 19th council meeting? So th these are questions for your consideration. Uh, we, will ha we have requested a legal opinion from Corporation Council on redistricting requirements and protections under the Voting Rights Act, and we will keep councillors updated on any information that, has, that, will be, that is being received. So um, I'd also like to note that my, our colleagues, Councillor Lara and Councillor Fernandez Anderson, have joined us. Uh, Vice Chair, have you any, anything to say? Yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and just, um, just appreciate the um, amount of engagement that's happening around redistricting. Um, it's a process that happens every 10 years. Um, so the engagement that's happening on the council and outside in the public um, is very important. And um, looking forward to the conversations, listening to everyone on their maps and um, seeing if we can create a more equitable, equitable map uh, that's grounded in the Voter Rights Act um, and those principles um, to make sure that uh, communities um, are able to elect the candidates of their choice. So looking forward to the presentations um, and thank you guys for joining us. I also want to just give a big thank you to central staff, uh, Council Braden's team and my team on all their work um, with us on this process. Thank you. Thank you. So we call on, uh, I think it's the, which mark is that? Is that the, that's the Arroyo Fernandez Anderson map, is that? I believe so, but I think they're going that. So that might be the pick of Murphy map. Pick of Murphy map. So, um, Councillor Murphy, are you ready to present your map and discuss your? Uh, Councillor Royal? No, he's not here. He's coming at 12. Oh, he's coming at 12. He's not able to get here. Okay. Um. So I'll just 1216. 1216. So I could find a person. Okay. Councillor Murphy, I realize we're taking you slightly out of order, but the other um, councillor's not here, so. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Vice Chair, for having this hearing, this working session. I had um, shared and presented my map with my colleagues in the public two weeks ago, and then with the advice of the Chair, filed it at this last Council meeting so that we could include it in today's working session as filed maps, because we had previous maps filed that way. So. I know many of my colleagues have looked at my proposal. I'll go over a few of the key points. Um, historically, the districts, which are nine, which have been nine for a long time now, have represented specific neighborhoods throughout the city. District one has been Charlestown, East Boston, North End. District two has been Chinatown, Downtown, South Boston, and the South End. District 3, Dorchester. District 4, Mattapan, Dorchester, Rosendale, Jamaica Plain. District 5, High Park and Rosendale. District 6, Jamaica Plain and West Roxbury. District 7, Roxbury, South End and Dorchester. And District 8, Back Bay, Beacon Hill, Fenway, Kenmore, Mission Hill and the West End. And District 9 has always been the Alston Brighton neighborhoods of the city. The map that I proposed preserves these neighborhoods in their respected districts. It is important that we preserve these communities in the same districts they have always known them to be in. It provides a sense of place, content, continuity, and community for our constituents. As we heard in last week's public hearing, and I hear, and I know all of us here at different community meetings we're at, and I think you mentioned it in your opening remarks, um, you know, there has been a lot of buzz and talk, which I think is wonderful around the city. People are engaged and aware that this process is going on. As we know, this only happens once every 10 years, but it does have a lasting effect for the next 10 years and going forward. 
As I was creating my map, I was ensuring to keep in mind the different criteria the committee is examining to ensure fairness and equity. That includes equal population, compact districts, contiguous boundaries, preservation of neighborhoods and communities. We know that not all neighborhoods, not all communities of interest will be able to stay in one district. There are those who are always going to be close to or near an edge of a district, a boundary line, but we will try, and I did try to make sure that as many as I could, keeping all of the other um, criteria in mind and in place as we moved the map around and as everyone knows you know the hours it takes to make sure because when you make one precinct move it doesn't just shift population for many others it also then changes demographics that you need to adjust and make sure that we're always keeping in mind the equitable piece to this whole conversation so when it comes to equal population, one of the biggest things we saw um, coming into this process that District 2 has a lot of um, extra voters in their district, that too, um, too many voters in District 2 and District 3 needed to grow. Those were the only two within the legal range. We know that a 5% deviation is in good faith, but legally 10%, it can be as far as 10% off. Each district has a, in my map, has a 0.5 deviation from this target, except for District 8, which has a deviation of two, and that was because of the small but important neighborhoods. As you heard when I listed out the different neighborhoods that each district comp um, composes, it's Back Bay, Beacon Hill, Fenway, Kenmore, Mission Hill, and the West End. So to make sure that those small but important neighborhoods weren't split, keeping them together did put District 8 a little bit further, but 2%, way below the good faith percentage. These deviations are obviously all under the 10 and in good faith. Compact districts, number two. In my proposal map, all nine districts are compacted, attempt to have straight borders, and are not oddly shaped. We know the history of gerrymandering it was the politician Jerry and his maps looked like salamanders, which then we've coined the term gerrymandering because sometimes politicians, um, people in power, will try to snake maps around. We know historically across the country that happens in all different levels. Um, so we had to keep in mind, too, the shape of the map matters, that we're not stretching too far, or even though they might touch, they touch in a very odd way. We're, I kept that in mind. Number three, contiguous borders. In my proposed map, I did ensure all nine districts boundaries are contiguous so there are no outlier precincts. And four, preservation of neighborhoods and communities. I did already mention that not every neighborhood or community may feel that we were able to, but there is never going to be one map that includes everyone's needs as long as we are able to, in my mind, make um, you know, the, the best one so the most people feel like their voices and their needs are being heard. As I said at the council meeting the other day, um, certain ones, just to name a couple, Fields Corner, now known as Little Saigon of the strong Vietnamese community where I live blocks away from is would be connected with 1601 and possibly 1603 adding to it to make it even bigger. Mattapan, which had been in, pre in a previous redistricting, been cut. The seaport, which we know um, used to be parking lots, then became buildings, and now through the um, last year we did the extra voting precincts, so we know that. Um, the seaport did not have a voting precinct, and 6-1 had the most voters go to it. So now we have 6-11, 6-12, which make up the seaport district, which is around 5,000, um, a little bit more than 5,000 residents live in that neighborhood, which would stay together. They do have a voting location now, two precincts there, which is important. Jamaica Plain, and also not just neighborhoods, um, the communities of interest, we've talked about different communities, also Catholic parishes throughout the city. Anyone um, 
growing up or if anyone comes and asks, anytime I tell people I am the at-large district councilor from Dorchester, the first question nine times out of 10 is asked which parish. So I usually start off by saying St. Anne's is it, that's my parish, but our neighborhood of Dorchester, our side of Dorchester, we know Dorchester is the largest borough in the country and the largest neighborhood obviously here in our city, much larger than most others. Um, that we need two counselors to um, make up because we have way more than 75,000 residents in the neighborhood of Dorchester. In, this, in the last um, working session, we did start to talk about um, the map that I was proposing. Some I heard stated that maybe District 4 is, um, was packing we know that the, the numbers, which I have repassed out if you didn't have the packet from last time, District 4 has historically um, always had a larger black population. And in my first attempt, and I did say this, I just want to reiterate, when I proposed my map and put the work into it, it was to present a map which is here behind me. Yeah, you know, staying to the way most districts had looked in the past, but also keeping them compact, but knowing that we could easily make shifts. So if District 4 needed a certain um, demographic population to pick up, or if a community of interest was left out by one precinct, I do feel like the Rubik's Cube, it would be easy to make shifts in a way, if it would be adding 16-3, not just 16-1 to District 3, then we could pick up, for example, um, like 19-7 to District 4. I felt as though this map was easily um, adjustable, which I know these are why we're here together as colleagues to talk about the maps. I don't feel like I presented my map to pit my map against others, just to be another base to start from in a conversation that I hope we'll obviously continue to have to come to a consensus that obviously keeps all of the rules, the voting act, the laws in mind, but also making sure that historic districts stay whole with changes made needed only, only when needed, not to make unnecessary changes if, if it's needed, absolutely, we have to have that conversation, see where we can take, pull, and push from, but keeping all that in mind is important. As I started um, as before, uniting our neighborhoods is an essential goal of redistricting, and my proposal joins key precincts in Mattapan to unite the neighborhood, which is 98.7 people of color. This is the reason for the increased percentage in the number of people of color in District 4, which is close to um, like a 1% increase to unite the neighborhoods and not to split them. Within the legal district, not packing, so I do think in cases like that, if it's an Asian community, if it's a white community, a black community, if we know that that community of interest and has a neighborhood boundary and has a political community power that we don't want to split them, especially if it's within the legal district um, numbers. Um, Many, um, I mean, I am open and hoping that we as a group can collegially work together to get to the outcome, which I know the city is watching and hoping we do, and I am confident that we will. In no way were any of these precincts um, set in stone, but I do think that it's a really good starting point. I mentioned Ward 19, Precinct 7 could be added to District 4. Um, that precinct is almost 60% white, so that would add more white voters to District 4. Um, and in conclusion, I feel that this map is the best starting point moving forward. My numbers are near perfect with the smallest deviation from the target population compared to any of the other maps. And I also kept the identity of each district the same and did not split any neighborhoods up for the most part as I could. I am hoping that it can be a basis for the conversation that people consider looking at. And I do, um, I do know that when shared at first, um, made sure, and you all got copies, but also the PDF file that had lots of additional data information that I think is important, where you could click and look at any precinct, the changes, the current precincts that the districts had when we went into it, the ones we needed to 
add, because now we know we have 20 more voting precincts, and to look at the deviations that were made when we made those small changes. So I'm asking um, you know, my colleagues to use the work that our office did as information, good information for this conversation going forward, and would be um, open to any questions, or I'm not sure how, Chair, you want to go forward after people talk about their map. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. I, I really appreciate the amount of work you've put into this and uh, the, um, the attention to detail and the, uh, uh, the ability to get such equal, equally matched, numerically equally matched uh, districts. That's a lot of work, and uh, we appreciate your efforts, and we welcome your contribution to the conversation. Um, Councillor Arroyo and Councillor Fernandez Anderson, would you like to speak to your map? And um, then uh, I think we'll uh, open it up for for questions um, at the. Uh, and I also know that Councillor Baker is going to give us a history lesson of how, over the last four decades how how the different maps evolved over time. But we'll let the um, proponents of the new maps uh, speak. Councillor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. One second. Thank you. That's what I was waiting for. Is there a clicker or for the for the slideshow? Madam Chair, uh, we've spoken on our redistricting plan in prior uh, council hearings. Uh, if you have in front of you that map, uh, you can look at it now. Uh, what the goal here on this map was to address the population uh, increases that were in District 2 uh, and the population deficiencies that were in District 3, while making sure that in our formulation of this map, we tried our very best to respect existing neighborhood boundaries. And so in this map, uh, you'll see that we unified Mattapan around Blue Hill Ave. We unified uh, Rosendale more than it is unified, I think, on any of these maps, uh, including around American Legion Highway, which uh, is another major through fare. Uh, we unified or tried to respect uh, lines like the uh, Dorchester Avenue or Mass Avenue uh, and Massachusetts Ave. Uh, and so if you look at the map here, you'll see that we've extended District 3 into the South End. Uh, the purpose of extending District 3 into the South End was twofold. One, it already had several precincts in the South End, uh, but also the South End has, under almost every variation of a map, been distributed in multiple Places It's had multiple council leadership, and I've heard people state that uh, neighborhoods like to have split uh, neighborhoods, that they, they like having multiple councillors to go to. Uh, but in my experience, that is not the case. Uh, certainly in Rosendale, uh, both on a district level as well as a state level, there has been much consternation in the last decade over being split between so many places, what it tends to make neighborhoods feel like is that they are a minimized portion of that person's load and are less likely to receive the attention they receive. And so we tried to ensure in this map that we didn't do that. So we unified Rosendale. We unified the South End as a whole. We essentially made a South End Dorchester district. Uh, we had to address the issues in South Boston. Uh, and so we made a map that still falls within the uh, acceptable deviation range. Uh, it ensures a uh, relatively equitable way forward where we united communities of interest like the Vietnamese community. We ensured to uh, unite more of the Cape Verdean community in District 7. As we've all done maps, we're aware that the Cape Verdean community is not as tightly packed uh, as the Vietnamese community where there are several precincts where they are dominant. Uh, the Cape Verdean community stretches into multiple precincts and sort of falls within multiple districts. Uh, and so this makes sure that there's some unison within District 7. Uh, it ensures that 
the LGBT plus communities of interest that exist in the South End are unified within Dorchester, uh, which is, I think, very good. Uh, it adds to the uh, diversity of Dorchester's uh, sort of fabric here where it adds to, I believe it adds up to about 3% or something short of 3% on the Asian population because there is an Asian population in the South End to, the, to combine it with the Dorchester Asian population. Um, I think there are things that we have heard and certainly we are taking into account in terms of uh, the Chinese Progressive Association and the residents of the South End and sort of what they are thinking about. Uh, I think there's a push and pull here where some members of South End would like to see a unified South End and some communities of interest within the South End would like to stay uh, close in hand or close to their sort of uh, known communities, folks who feel like they were sort of pushed out of Chinatown or very closely tied to Chinatown but live in other places that aren't Chinatown. And so that is something we've taken into account. Uh, when you look at the uh, map here, we attempt to keep all of the racial demographics about the same as 2010. Uh, and so when you do that, uh, we end up very similar. Uh, if you run our numbers by the maps in 2010, the population percentages of those populations, even though we know that the African-American black population has decreased in the city of Boston, which we thought was incredibly important. Uh, this map sort of makes it so that for the most part, uh, it's not perfect in this, but for the most part, neighborhoods that have been split uh, amongst various factions in terms of various district counselors uh, are sort of unified as best they can be. Uh, we do have two Dorchester seats, uh, though I recognize just like we talk about communities of interest with uh, the Vietnamese community that some of these, uh, that not all of Dorchester is sort of uniform or the same. There are pockets of different communities within Dorchester, but uh, in as far as neighborhoods go, Dorchester has always had two sort of district seats, District 4 and District 3, and this doesn't change that. It makes sure that District 4 and District 3 remain sort of Dorchester-based seats. Uh, it ensures that District 7 remains a Roxbury-centered seat. Uh, it does uh, very little, uh, I don't think it does anything like any other map to uh, District 9 or District 1. Uh, I believe on our map we have District 1 picking up uh, the West End. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's essentially the same. We have uh, Councillor Bach or District uh, 8 picking up, I believe it's 4-6, uh, uh, which is the area around the Prudential, uh, which I believe is one of the ones that was re-precincted. Uh, but other than that, it remains relatively the same. And so this impacts, in my opinion, the least amount of districts. It, it impacts, frankly, the districts that have the most population deviations, the ones that need the most work, uh, while doing the very best to keep these communities whole uh, in terms of, or to sort of remake them whole, uh, such as uh, Rosendale uh, in the South End, while also making sure to sort of try to honor uh, the natural major through fares that come through these areas like Mass Ave, uh, like Blue Hill Ave, uh, like American Legion Highway, in ways where you sort of know who represents you and, and why. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's the general overview uh, of our map. We do believe it's a, a strong map, uh, mostly because in every other variation of this map, and, and we may come to a conclusion that it makes sense, but in every other variation of this map, you relegate the South End again to being split uh, into multiple districts. And even on our map, it's impossible to completely unify it. I think there's two precincts uh, that fall outside of what the BPDA calls the South End uh, that still remain in District 2. But for the most part, no other map is going to do what, what this did, uh, which is unify the South End in this way. Um, and so there's, there's really a lot here, I think, for, for the standpoint of trying to keep neighborhoods cohesive um, and follow those lines. And I think there's been some things uh, that we sort of pre-saw. I, I personally believe, and I think it's uh, a good way to look at this, is when you have municipal leadership in line with state leadership, I think that's important. And when you look at the lines that were drawn for the Senate districts and, and who those people represent, who their constituents are, our council lines try to mimic that so that there's more cohesion between state and municipal leadership on issues because they're responding to the exact same constituencies. Uh, and so that sort of elevates those constituencies' voices 
Uh, and so I think that's, that's incredibly important. That's something that we looked at on top of neighborhood cohesion, on top of communities of interest, is how this map and corresponding state leadership maps look, because I think it's important for communities to have a voice. I know in Rosendale, for instance, they're often splintered. I think there's like, depending on where you are, you might have four state reps, you might have th you know, three senators. Uh, and we've, that's been an ongoing uh, joke in Rosendale for a while now, and this makes it so that there's a more uniform way of approaching those folks so that people don't feel as if they have to go to multiple uh, levels to get their issues heard. And so this allows for more cohesion because people are responding to the very same constituencies. Uh, that's a very brief overview, but I feel like we've spoken more in depth on this uh, map, and I, I don't want to take much more time on it. Um, except to say that if Councillor Anderson wants to add anything, she, she can. But I frankly think this is uh, a, a relatively strong map. Uh, and we've been very open about sort of the genesis of it and why we're, we've decided that this makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor um, Arroyo. Um, and thank you for your work on this. Uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. You have the chip floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to the Vice Chair as well for holding this working session, um, and again for making it um, public, uh, televised. And thank you to Council Arroyo, my co-sponsor on this. I think I will reserve my time for any questions. Happy to um, further discuss. Council Arroyo did a wonderful job explaining it thoroughly. So um, at this at this time, if I could just uh, answer questions, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, we will present our, um, um, the other um, docket that we put forward for consideration and comment. Um, again, as I stressed the other day, um, this is really uh, just to add to the conversation and see if we, can, as a body, can come up with a consensus map that, that addresses the many, many concerns that uh, our folks have uh, with regard to all of the points that are already, have already been discussed. Um, our redistricting plan makes a total of 18 precinct reassignments between districts compared to the current um, baseline um, city council map. Um, these changes result in the equalization of District 2's population while maintaining Ward 8 and Precinct 1 Cathedral and Ward 9 Precinct 1 Villa Victoria uh, the South End precincts with significant Chinese immigrant populations in, in, the Chinese, in, the, in one district with the Chinatown core. Um, keeping these communities unified is important um, because of the ruling, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, previous litigation that said that um, in 1985 redistricting case Latino political action committees versus the city of Boston the court recognized that Boston's Latino and Asian communities were interspersed among many different neighborhoods and, should not and could not constitute a, a majority in any one district. Um, the court also reported evidence which suggests that a minority, the minority population of the South End in Chinatown is capable of exerting considerable political influence within the district. And that is one of the primary reasons why we've made an effort to try and unify and keep keep those, those two precincts in District 2. Um, the most significant change in our proposal, and I also encourage you, we have the, the handout. Um, the most significant change in our proposal is shifting of eight precincts along the boundary between, between District 3 and District 4, uh, proposed on the basis of the Voting Right Rights Act considerations. Uh, the same Boston redistricting court ruling considered the balance between cracking and packing in respect of an effective major ma majority of min for minority districts. Um, a minority population of at least 65% is a single, in a single member district is necessary to give major minority voters a reasonable opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice. And while 65% as the total population goal 60% has been the aim of the voting age population uh, to reach an effective majority. So that's another, another uh, metric that is used. So in 2010, District 3 had 62.3% total minority population and 58.3% um, voting age min uh, minority population. In, 2010, in 2020, uh, that, and, and, and this has to be considered, I'll just back up a minute. 
The, the goal is to try and strengthen or, strengthen or, uh, or maintain, maintain or, uh, or strengthen three or four uh, minority opportunity districts in the city. Um, this, the, the, people have looked at the maps and looked at all sorts of different permutations and the four is the maximum number of opportunity districts or majority minority districts that, that is possible in, the, in any possible scenario in the city. So it's really important to try and strengthen and maintain the minority uh, districts. In 2020, District 3, 61.8% total majority, total minority population and 58.5% voting age minority population. Our proposal, in our proposal, uh, District 3, 64.9% um, total minority would uh, produce a voting age minority, 61.5% voting age minority. Um, so really it's, it's um, the, in terms of strengthening uh, the, exi the existing uh, minority districts, uh, major majority minority districts, this is the proposal that we have, are putting on the table for now. Um, we understand and appreciate that this is a 3% bump in the total population and voting age population, making District 3 the fourth truly minority opportunity district uh, by voting age. We absolutely recognise that the proposal would be disruptive to the lives of community members, but that it would also make the greatest difference towards ensuring that all residents of, co of colour across our city have a fair opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. Uh, um, so, um, so we, I will just go through the the um, the, um, the, pr the presentation and the handout. Uh, so we've, we mentioned this proposed of eight, proposed precincts proposed to change districts is a total of 18. Um, in proposed of district one, uh, we would be adding. Let's see, adding precinct. We oh, got this. Precinct one is uh, district one is st staying re reasonably stable. We ha are adding. Where are we adding? <laughs> Back to the first page. Um, adding thirteen ten no three ten to district one. That's the only addition to to district one. Uh, four two would be added to district eight. Seven six would be added to District 3. 8, 1 would be added to District 2, and 9, 1 would be added, kept in District um, 2. Those are the two South End uh, precincts. 14, 5 would, would be in F District 4. It's in dis moved from District 5. 14, 4 would move from District 5 to District 4. 16, 1, would move from District 4 to District 3. 16, 3 would move to District, from District 4 to District 3. 16, 8 would move from District 3 to District 4. 16, 11 would move from District 3 to District 4. 17, 2 is in District 4, it would move to District 3. And 17, 9 would move from District 4 to District 3. 1711 would move from District 4 to District 3. 1713 would move from District 3 to District 4. 1912 would move from District 4 to District 5. 20, Precinct 1, would move from District 6 to District 5. And 20, District 8, would move from District 5 to District 6. Those are the two precincts um, that would be sw swapped out um, in uh, those in those two adjoining districts, um, pardon? the first two switches. Uh, District three. Uh, have you got the handout, Councillor Flynn of Flaherty? Sorry, this one here. This one. It's all in there. 
The first one would be district, uh, the move from District 8 to District 1. The baseline, it, it was placed in, 310 was placed in District 8 on the baseline uh, map and it will be moved to District 1. And the next one was f f four t uh, 4 2 would go from 2 to 8. So among the proposals, this plan was also have the least amount of minority residents affected by voting precinct changing, uh, their voting precinct changing districts. If passed, uh, we hope that, the, um, that this map that we are proposing will address the issue of merely strengthening our minor majority minority districts in the city uh, for the next 10 years and help uh, uh, offer offer min, min, communities of colour uh, and our minority districts in our minority districts majority minority districts as an opportunity to elect uh, the candidates of their choice. So, um, any qu uh, right? Let's see. So let's go to uh, page, in District 3, uh, the District 3 and District 4 are the two districts that will be most impacted by the changes in this map. Um, district 3, um, the, in District 3, the white alone population is 35.1%, and uh, the voting uh, age population by, um, by age is 82.1%. And the white alone voting age population, I understand that the total population is one metric and then the voting age population is another metric. White alone population in District 3 is 35.1%. And uh, the voting age uh, population is 82.1%. White alone, 38.5%. So, um, this map would, with the changes in this map, the total minority population in District 3 would uh, increase from 58.4% to 61.5%. And we feel that that greatly strengthens the majority minority vote in District 3. Um, and this is one offering. Uh, you know, we fully understand that there are other, there's so many permutations on this that will get us to. Uh, if this is the goal that we're going for, that there are other, other options, but this is what we're presenting right now. In District 4, um, District 4, uh, white alone population in District 4 is, uh, in, this, in this offering is 10.5%. The voting age population by, uh, by age, the total pop, um, the voting age population percentage is 75%. 75 uh, white alone voting age population is 12.2% in District 4. And this, in this map, the total minority, um, uh, the total minority population by, by total population is 89.5, and the total minority by voting age is 87.8. So again, I think we've, we're trying to strengthen the, um, uh, actually, we're trying to balance the, 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 the racial uh, minority, total minority numbers between District 3 and District 4 to try and get a little more, uh, uh, increase the opportunity in District 3. Um, I think that's really the, the crux of it. Those are the two, that those working on the margins of District 3 and District 4 is where we have focused a lot of our attention. The other uh, precincts, the South End precincts, have already discussed. Thank you. Um,
So um, I, I'm going to call on. Um, I just want to read something uh, about the um, U.S. Department of Justice document on on uh, on uh, the voting rights. Um, I'd like to read into the record a portion of the U.S. Department of Justice document published on September 1st, 19, 2021, entitled "Guidance under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act 52." Uh, Act 52 USC 10301 for redistricting and methods of electing government bodies. This document is available on the committee website at boston.gov redistricting and specifically we'll read into the record pages 6 and 7 which cover section 2 of the Voting Rights Act regarding discriminatory result of redistricting plans. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act prohibits, among other things, any electoral practice or procedure that minimizes or cancels out the voting strength of members of a ra racial or language minority groups in the voting population. This phenomenon is known as vote dilution. In Thurn Thur Thornburg versus G Gingles, 478 U.S. 30, 1986, uh, the Supreme Court set out the framework of cha for challenges to such practices and procedures. Analysis begins by considering whether three jingles pr preconditions exist. First, the minority group must be sufficiently large and geographically compact to constitute a majority of the voting age population in a single member district. Second, the minority group must be politically cohesive. And third, the majority must vote sufficiently as a bloc to enable it, in the absence of, a spe of special circumstances, such as the minority candidate running unopposed, usually to defeat the minority group's preferable candidate. If all three jingles preconditions are present, conditional consideration proceeds to an analysis of the totality of circumstances in the jurisdiction. This analysis incorporates factors enumerated in the Senate report that accompanied the 20, 1982 Voting Rights Amendments. The <clears throat> amendments, uh, as Rep number 97-417 at 28-29-1982, which are generally known as the Senate factors. These factors are themselves drawn from earlier case law, and the factors include the extent of any history of official discrimination in the state or political subdivision that touched the right of the members of a minority group to register to vote or otherwise to participate in the democratic process. The extent to which voting in the elections of the state and political sub or sub political subdivision is racially polarized. The extent to which the state and political subdivision are used unusually large are, has used unusually large election districts, majority vote requirements, anti-single shot provisions, or other voting practices or procedures that may enhance the opportunity for discrimination against a minority group. If there's a candidate slating process, whether the members of the, of the minority group have been denied access to that process. The extent to which members of the minority group in the state or political subdivision bear the effects of discrimination in such areas as education, employment and health, which hinder their ability to participate effectively in the political process. And whether political campaigns have, characterized, are, have been characterized by overt or subtle racial appeals, and the extent to which members of the minority group have been elected to public office in the jurisdiction. The Senate report also identified two additional factors that have been probative, have probative value in some cases. Whether there is a significant lack of responsiveness on the part of elected officials to, partic to the particularized needs of the members of the minority group and whether the policy underlying the state or political subdivisions use of such voting quali qualification uh, prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure is tenuous. So that's uh, just some background. This will be placed on the, on the, uh, the website as well for folks to reference. This, this document is available on the website boston.gov backslash redistricting and uh, we, we've just put that into the record as some background information. 
Uh, folks, uh, would anyone like to um, have questions for the present proponents of the different maps right now? Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. I beg your pardon, um, Councillor Flynn, you have been lost. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to the Vice Chair, uh, Council Rell, and Chair Braden for the important work you're doing. Um, I've been listening to the debate for, for a period of time, but I wanted to weigh in on a couple, couple of issues that I, I thought were, were important. Um, you know, preservation of core, core districts to the extent possible. We should maintain districts as previ previously drawn as much as we can. Um, with that in mind, as it impacts my district and District 2, it's not my district, it's, it's, the, it's the people's district. Um, it's critically important to me that parts of the South, End, South Boston that are currently in District 2 remain, remain in District 2. Um, and also compactness so that we have a minimum distance between all parts of a constituency so that ideally a district would be, you know, a, a circle or a square, hexagon, some, something that, that makes sense. Uh, preservation of communities of interest, keeping areas where residents have a common interest together. That is important to me, as I have emphasized again and again over the last five years, uh, the important relationship that Chinatown has with, with District, Ch District 2 and keeping the Chinese community together in District 2, in Castle Square, which is outside of traditionally Chinatown, which is in the south end, uh, must be part of, of, of that continuation so that our Chinese and our AAPI community is not broken up into different districts. I think all versions of maps so far show that. Um, I know that Villa Victoria and Cathedral um, <clears throat> would also need to stay in the same district. That's something I support. Um, you know, I've, I've seen different maps that it's in different districts, um, but I, it's important that we work together to make sure the interest and the voices of, of those residents are heard. Um, overall, throughout this redistricting process, I'd like to retain and keep um, neighborhoods of South Boston that have traditionally been part of District 2, but also the South Boston waterfront as well. Um, Fort, Fort Point, South Boston Waterfront, we have a lot of basic city services that are lacking down there and I've been working over the last five years to, to include them, and including a voting presence, a fire station, a police station. We have, we have zero down there and I've, been, I've made it a priority to, to change that. Um, also, they have a, 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 a strong connection and relationship with the Wharf District as well. Um, with the Fort Point and the waterfront, uh, so I'm, so I know the Wharf District. Um, based on a lot of these relationships, also would like to um, continue to stay in with the South Boston waterfront as well. But I'm I'm open to working with my colleagues and and to talking about uh, talking about these issues. I don't have anything, um, any questions per se, but I just wanted to highlight some of the issues that I had. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the uh, Vice Chair also. Thank you, Councillor President Flynn. Uh, Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I know you had to explain that you had, seven, you had 18 precinct changes uh, in your proposed and, uh, and um, the Vice Chair's proposed map. I just had a similar question to both uh, um, of our other maps, so to Councillor Murphy, um, how many precinct changes um, to, into districts uh, in your proposed map. I can get you that number. We had it on a different slide. I'll find out. Great, thank you. And, and I'll then do that now. Thank you. And through the chair to the makers of the other map, Council Royo, uh, Council Anderson, Fernandez, Anderson, um, how, ma how many uh, precincts uh, will be changing districts in your map proposal? Uh, we have 25. 25 precincts change districts in your proposal? Yes. And then just through the chair, whenever Council Murphy can get that information to me. Yeah, Councilor Murphy's looking that up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
Any other questions right now? Um, I, I'm, I'm, Councillor Baker has um, prepared a, a little historic um, background to the history of precincting over the um, redistricting over the last 40 years. Thank you for your work on this, Councillor Baker. Yeah. Would you like to have the floor right now and just to give us sure. a, a brief um, history sure. lesson? Sure, and, and less, of a, less of a presentation, more of just maps of what the original core districts were like. So I think Council President read them, read them off the, the um, redistricting principles or criteria that the state followed. You know, it was compactness, continuity, uh, contiguity, I believe, I think I have that right. Preservation of political subdivisions, which are the boundaries, which would, which would be, you know, main streets, they could be railroads, they could be parks. Um, pre preservation of community interests and preservation of cores of prior, prior districts. Um, and I had said this from the beginning, especially when we were running, running out of time in this, we should look at what our districts are now and, and less, less trying to um, go into more political aspiration sort of changes and, and because these, these principles are what, um, are what we need to attain otherwise that is how you get challenged in court. And I, and I would say, I don't see a map, I, I don't think any of our maps would, would, would stand up to a court challenge, challenge right now as it stands. Um, so I have from 83 when the, when the maps, when, when, we first, when we first became districts, 93, 103, 13, 13, which I was involved in 13. And I'll, I'll speak about 13 a little bit. 13, I was a brand new councillor. I was elected in November 11 uh, on a Tuesday. On that Thursday, 2011, uh, Maureen Feeney had, had left to, to become the, to become the uh, city clerk. So District 3 was without representation. The body asked me to come in and sit in working sessions. Now, in full disclosure, I was a printer. I'm a construction type of guy. I never had a computer or even a, or even a business card or an or a, uh, email address at that point. Much more comfortable with a, a screw gun or a hammer in my hand than any, any sort of this thing here. And I believe I was taken advantage of at, at that point. Um, I was told that we needed to, to gain in the north. That isn't necessarily the case. If I knew what I know today, this map wouldn't look the way it, it looks. In Dorchester, we, um, when you say you're from Dorchester, or when you did say you were from Dorchester, you would always identify parish. So we have very clear parish boundaries, very clear parish boundaries that I, I believe should be respected. Um, my community of interest is Dorchester, based around the original map which they took Dorchester out and say, okay, this, this is a boundary, let's, let's use that boundary. Um, what happened to me was they took 16, 16, 1 and 3 away from me, which, which shouldn't have happened, and then they, and then they took um, from Ward 17, the precincts that make up St. Greg's Parish would be 17, 4, 17, 12, 17, 14. That would make up, that would make up Lower Mills and also St. Greg's Parish. Another thing that happens down there that is that the Neponset River provides a clear boundary. When you come from Milton into Boston, you hit District 3 through Lower Mills here. And on the left, on the, the southwest side, that boundary over here would be St. Greg's Parish. Uh, numerous, not numerous, a couple of these maps here, they go in and they, they cut up the core of my district, which would be St. Anne's, St. Brendan's, um, core, core of the district. They are now merged into St. Martin de Pors. Uh, I, would, I would argue that those districts should absolutely stay together. That's, like I said, a core of the original historic district. I think we're trying to do a lot here in a little bit of time, and I think we're going to get into trouble doing it. Just, just being straight on that, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. I'm, I would like to see those precincts come back into District 3, and District 3 start to retreat out of what is those downtown precincts that I got sent into because people, 
I won't get into that there. Just because I was I was taken I was taken out of. I don't think there's really that much commonality if we if we talk about whether if it's zoning uh, Dorchester being one F two F three F. Uh, zoning pretty much across the board. You, you start going into the South End and, and even into South Boston, you have more of a multi, uh, I believe it's called multi-family industrial, something like that. Not much commonality there with Dorchester. Um, again, uh, and I would also argue, I would, uh, and no, these precincts down here, these three precincts, and even you could add 1711 in there, all majority black precincts. So that would add to the black number in the, the, the black voting power in, di in District 3, which I would argue now. Now, again, I think us saying that we want to make District 4 an opportunity district where it's already 60 40, pretty close, pretty close. I think someone that, that could, could coalesce around communities could absolutely um, either knock me off or, or, or be elected to that seat if you have. If, if you're able to go across multiple communities. Um, the health care, the health care, the health center movement was one of the, one of the things that was originally talked about in the 83 district. Now, the very first health center in the country was Geiger Gibson, 13-3. The second one was Neponset, which would be St. Anne, St. Brendan, 16-8, 16-5, 16-9, 16, 8, 16, 5, 16 9, 10 core, core of district three. And, and another, and I just say this because my mother was a founding member of the Little House Health Center on Dorchester Ave, which was in St. Margaret, St. Williams Parish. One of the things that did happen that was good last time was I was able to pick up 7879, which unified the St. Margaret's Parish. My theme here is parishes, communities, over these last 40 years, those parishes have been decimated. And in the St. Brendan's Parish is one of the parishes where the scandal played out. And the Catholic Church wasn't very good to that community there. And they still haven't really answered to a lot of the wrongs that happened in that parish. We now, I believe, cutting St. Brendan's, St. Anne's away from their core, um, splitting Adams Adams Corner, which is which is a, a, a core district, would be would be uh, similar to taking Nubian Square out of out of Roxbury. Um, again, this isn't about political aspirations. This is about compactness, continuity. Yeah, uh, preservation preservation of core districts and, and divisions. Real um, clean looking clean looking districts. Some of the districts that we have here now, uh, and I don't mean any disrespect here, but um, the border between between three and four looks like looks like the the turkeys that we grew that we drew in in first grade. There, yeah. that's not a clear boundary. That's something that that is that is um, can be challenged. And we don't have the time to go through multiple maps here. Last time, I believe we we. We threw out three maps. They were all vetoed across the hall, and I believe it was the fourth map that we that we came up with. Might have been the third map. I, I I don't really remember. But District Three, I believe, with these changes here, which gave me my southern border, which unite unite St. Greg's back into District Three, which would unite them with Mont de Pores and with St. Ambrose and with with St. Margaret's. That was what the district w was based around. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, I think we have to look at precincts that are up around here that, that are gonna connect your district, Madam Chair, because I think in 10 years, we're all gonna need to add probably, it's either gonna be a new district or it's gonna be everybody going up to 80,000. We're unable to do that with you if this, with your district, rather, with this precinct stuck here, this precinct being unlocked now would allow would allow um, district two. No, not two. Kenzie. It can, it. Now would have more commonality, I believe, in this part of this in this part of the city. Maybe the south end is there. 
that's for something to look at down the future. I think we got to get back and stick with our feet here in, in, in compact districts, changes around the edges, and, and quite frankly, these districts, as much as anything, need to look compact. They need to look like we try to have the least amount of space, physical space, from point A to point B. Um, the council from, from District 5 talked about, I've heard him mention a couple times, about mimicking the lines of the first Suffolk Senate, Senate District. Senate District is 140 people, 140, 150, basically twice the size of what we have. I agree with him. He's correct. But two districts. District 3 mimics the South, the, the, the first Suffolk. And then in the North, District 2 would mimic the north, northern part of that first Suffolk, Suffolk district. And I, I feel strongly about this, and I think that my community of interest, Dorchester, is being hurt in these proposals. And um, just so people know, I have retained counsel to protect, to do two things for me, to help come up with a map that will be defensible and will stand up in court, and also pr to protect District 3 from some of the maps that are happening right now. Because if, if, if District 3 gets hurt in this chamber, I'm going to have someone help me out. So it's not a threat. That's just more I'm protecting my district to make sure that our communities of interest and our parish communities and our sports communities and our uh, health care communities stay intact and thank you madam chair um, and again I, I, I'm looking to retreat from the south end and pick up what was traditionally ours in district 3 and, and adding those lower precincts I'm adding black populations I haven't I haven't come up with what the numbers will be, but if, if I pick up three precincts in the, in the southwestern corner, originally part of my district, that are all, I think they're at least 60% black precincts, that will, that will get us towards, towards where we want to be with an opportunity district in District 3. And one the last point that I will make, and thank you for allowing me the time, um, one point is when the state went through this exercise and they had been they did it for a year I know we're doing it for six weeks um, they abandoned voter age population that was unable to attain so I think we're complicating trying to get voting age population and this population we've got to get it close we've got to get it close you can't put a number there okay well then let's pull this precinct and that will get our percentage we're going down a pathway there where, where the maps will not be defensible if they're challenged. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Baker, and thank you for the, the review of the history. And these maps are all here. They're in packets. 83 is the first one when, when we had our first, day, our first um, districts. And the last one is uh, 13, which it's revised in 16 here. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, voting age... Uh, Population is one metric, and as you say, um, it has been used to evaluate maps in the past. Uh, the other thing that has been used in the past to, you know, uh, to be a consideration is projected growth, and I've, be, I've been assured that projected growth is not something we're allowed to consider or we shouldn't consider. But the reality is that there's a few things. If you if you listen to the folks at the state house who did the redistricting for the um, state uh, districts, senate and, and uh, rep districts, the one thing they bump into in the city of Boston is that we have these humongous precincts that have got six, I have a couple of them in my district, 6,000 people. And uh, we need desperately need as a city to make a commitment between now and the next time we do this, and I'll not be here, I can promise, um, you know, um, that we seriously need to push on, on the re-precincting process so that we don't have precincts that have got 6,000 people in them. Uh, I think that, that is something that's sort of, 
an urgent consideration. And then also the projected growth in, uh, in our city. I know that District 1 is looking at possibly 10,000 new units of housing. I think Galston Brighton is looking at, I don't know, we're under an incredible boom of, of housing development right now, and I, I, I don't know where it's going to land us, but um, I think that begs the question, then where do we go? Because in, Austin, in District, District 9, we're surrounded by Cambridge, Watertown, Newton, and Brookline. There's nowhere for us to go except back into District District 8. And District 8 is burgeoning uh, with a lot of new development as well. So this map is going to look very different in 10 years. Absolutely. Point of interest, uh, Madam Chair, District 3 has at least 10,000 10, units in the pipeline, probably, probably more. Uh, you know, that's a, a 10 to a 15 to a 20 year build out, but, but absolutely District 3 is, is experiencing the same thing. Yeah. Thank and, you. And, you know, th you know, the question for me was, you know, if the folks who drew the map the last time m anticipated a growth in, in South Boston of 18,000, would, would they have done something different? But then that's, uh, hindsight is always 2020. Yeah. Um, who's next? Councillor, I'm looking over this way. Who's next? Councillor Lara, Councillor Honours System here. Councillor Mejia, you're um, a committee member. We'll take you first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to my colleague for the history lesson. I really do appreciate it. And just for the record, I am from St. Ambrose Parish. But I also know that a lot has changed over the years. So the folks who are part of that parish, when I was growing up, were no longer part of that parish. So things continue to evolve as we continue to move people around. Um, and in regards to just the, the whole idea of uh, the anticipated growth in the city of Boston, I'm just curious, we can never anticipate um, the communities that are gonna be grow, uh, moving into those spaces and places, right? So if we're talking about growth and potential growth, we just don't know um, in terms of racial background what that's gonna look like. So I just wanna just kind of name that as something for us to hold into the space. Um, and I just also wanted to know whether or not we are live streaming yet um, and if this is being accessible to the community and if it's being recorded and that it'll then air at a later date. Just want to, I know we had some technical difficulties in the beginning, so I'm just getting a little check in to see how things are coming along just so that I'm clear because I see a blank screen. So I don't know if we're streaming. I don't know if we are recording and I, so. We, 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 we are having difficulty with our YouTube channel, but we are recording it and it will be, it oh, will be streaming. Oh, we're streaming. We're streaming. We've got it's that problem. It's, yeah, it's fixed. It's okay, great. Sorted out. Thank yeah. you. Just wanted to confirm because I did. And, and, I and sure. back to your question about, um, you know, the development, that's, that sort of is another reason why we really need to do a re-precincting process in, in uh, the city needs to commit to doing that before the, you know, when we get the next uh, census done to do a re-precincting you know, across the whole city. It's a very, it's a heavy lift this time we re-precincted. I think uh, we added uh, 20 new precincts, but uh, we, will, we will need to add significantly more next time round, and we need to address the situation where we have precincts in everyone, like everyone has got districts that have got a, a district ha that has huge precincts. And we, I have one precinct that has 6,000 people in it. Uh, so, you know, the re-precincting process is really critical to uh, put, put aside the projected, you know, the, the, develop, the development and the racial demog de demographics of the population in, in you know, really it's, we have to look at total population and then do the re-precincting process. Yeah. yeah. And um, through the chair to my council colleagues, either Councillor Murphy or Councillor Baker, you can vote, either one. If, if it's okay to ask a question through the chair, Go is ahead. that I've heard uh, the reference of parishes a few times in both of these spaces, so I just want to know for the record, are we considering that a community of interest? Is that a reason why we keep referencing the parish? Just so that I'm clear in terms of is that now being considered a community of interest, just so that I know what the dynamics are and what, what, what the where we're going with it so that I am mindful of that. So I'm just curious, It's are we looking at communities of interest with a parish? Is that what I'm gaining? Well, 
Councilor Baker. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my community of interest is Dorchester. Within that community of Dorchester, those boundaries are parishes that are that were boundaries that there's commonality commonality in. So, uh, for me, it's a it's a community of interest. Would would it, a definition as community of interest parish? I don't really know. For me, it's a community of interest. It's definitely a community of interest. But but my community of interest as a whole is Dorchester, and part of uniting Dorchester is uniting those parishes. If that makes sense to you. Um, th th thank you, um, Councillor Baker. Can I just clarify? You know, really, yeah. the parishes were a geographic, uh, not notwithstanding the fact that they were based on Catholic parishes, but their geographic locations that were used in days past to identify where you lived in the, in the city of, in, 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 Boston, the former, in, Dorchester. in Dorchester, which is the largest um, borough in the, in the country. Um, so, so it really was ge it's identifying the geographic location. And then, if I'm understanding correctly, the different parishes had a different flavor, like you had the Polish triangle, you had different ethnic groups that settled in different parts as well. So that right. that added to the color and the flavor of of each parish. So yeah. yeah. We 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 if I if I may <clears throat> we've been a pretty mixed community my my whole life. So you go from the Polish triangle, the Polish church in Andrew Square, come down to St. Margaret's. If you go to St. Margaret's, I'll be there Sunday at nine o'clock. You'll see Vietnamese, you'll see Haitian, you'll see a lot of Cape Verdean and you'll see some white people. Um, that's my original parish. St. Williams is gone, folded into St. Margaret. St. Ambrose would now be pretty much almost all Vietnamese. You go down to St. St. Mark's. That's going to be that's going to be immigrant and and a lot of uh, black people. Um, you go to St. Greg's. St. Greg's would be mixed, probably attending a, the parish itself. Those boundaries that we're looking at would be probably predominantly black in St. Greg's. And then the flip side of that, at St. Brendan, St. Anne's, now merged together, St. Martin de Pores would be pretty much white, but, but still mixed in there, Vietnamese, Haitian, black, black people. So thank you for the clarification, because folks who are listening in may not understand the concept of why, what the parish is the significant of this. Yeah. in Dorchester. Councillor Mejia? Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Just one more. Just, I just want to hear for the record, just so that I'm very clear, that uh, parishes are not going to be, con are, are they, are you going to be considering parishes as communities of interest in this particular discussion that we're engaging in right now? That's what I, I need to understand. I think, no. Okay, thank you. That's all. Did you have anything to add, Councillor Murphy? You, I know that the question was directed at you as well. Yeah, I'll follow up a little. Um, so, to me, the parishes are definitely geographic markers that make boundaries. In Dorchester, for historical reasons, were anchored more around their parishes and those churches. Most of them were Catholic churches, provided resources to the neighborhoods. I grew up in St. Anne's. I now live in St. Mark's. St. Anne's, when I was growing up there, was a predominantly Irish Catholic community, first, second generation immigrants. Um, St. Mark's is um, very Vietnamese now. One of the Sunday masses now is said all in Vietnamese. Um, so geographically, and I know there's obviously South Boston has, you know, Gate of Heaven and St. Bridget's, but Dorchester has always been a neighborhood of parishes that then businesses, right, business districts. So when you think of Adams Corner, which two of these maps do split the business district of Adams Village up Adams Street, you have 68 on one side and you have 611 on the other. So you would be splitting a business district, which is also in St. Brendan's Catholic community, but it is to me a business district. Um, and, you know, so you could be at Green Hills getting a tea and a cup of scone and then walk across the street if you preferred to go to the Airy Pub or to Molinari's for a nice dinner, you would be in another councillor's district. So to me, it, there's markers that are designating it. And you can really anchor someone who tells me often, many people say they're OFD 
originally from Dorchester. I like to say slid, I'm S still living in Dorchester, but anyone who has moved out of Dorchester will ask you what parish, and then they instantly, many from St. Peter's came into St. Anne's, and it's just a way, historically, like you said, you were there with me, you grew up in St. Ambrose, and St. William's we now burn down, and, but there's history to Dorchester, stronger than any other community in our city that anchors themselves around these churches, if they attend them or not, because we know St. Brandon's and St. Anne's needed to combine because many of their churches were empty. So it's more geographical markers and the community feels strong around those. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. You're welcome. Um, Councillor Mejia. I do appreciate my colleagues' um, sentiments in regards to the parish situation, but I will just have to say that um, we're, we're in a very different time here in the city of Boston, right? And I, I don't know if my particular reference to being from St. Ambrose, I did my first communion there, right? That was like 150 years ago. I, I think it would be really hard pressed for us to assume that black and brown people, when they ask, I know when I ask people where you're from, they tell me Fields Corner, Ashmont, they don't tell me they're from such and such parish. So I don't, I don't want us to get into that notion that black and brown people identify themselves with the parish. And I think that is really um, important for us to remain focused on the Voters' Right Act and what this is all about and not try to um, stretch things to fit a narrative. So I just want to go on the record in, in, in stating that, that Council Braden and, and Council Rural, that you know, as we continue to maintain the integrity of this process, that we are very clear in what our mandate is. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Can I respond to that? Councilor Baker. Thank you. Um, it's about the boundaries. This is minutia we're getting into here. It's about the boundaries. It's about Dot Ave. It's about the southwestern boundary. And that southwestern boundary happens to be St. Greg's or Lower Mills, whatever you want to do. Um, we're into, like I said, we're into minutia here. I never said it's a community of interest. Boundaries, compact, compact districts. What's, what's, what's happening to District 3 now, what people are trying to do to District 3 now, is wrong, and it's not defensible in court. So, whatever you, whatever you think of a parish, whatever you want to call a parish, whatever you want to call a neighborhood, call it whatever you want. My community of interest, my community of interest as the person that represents District 3 now, and it's my responsibility to protect District 3, the integrity of District 3, the historic integrity of District 3, Dorchester is my community of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Um, Councillor Lara, you are you are next up. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a few things. There is a um, sentence in the Section Two analysis around discriminatory result that talks about um, minority groups must be politically cohesive. Do we know if the Department of Justice gives us a definition of what they mean by politically cohesive, or do you have something that you would like to offer the body? That, that's certainly, um, we, we are uh, consulting with the law department, and that is certainly a question, um, a definition that we would probably need to get some. Um, so would you like to uh, put that, that's a, a question for the law department? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so what's the question again? We'll take note of it. Um, the definition, the U.S. Department's definition, or, you know, just kind of legal, um, any kind of legal guidance. Political, po political, political co cohesiveness. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm, um, I think we'll, we'll seek some legal advice on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, you know, and I know that just because a, a community is labeled, uh, like, say, Hispanic or Asian, doesn't mean that there's political cohesion. Yeah, and I think um, that we've heard and some even of that. <laughs> there isn't political cohesion in the white community either, for that matter. So, um, yes, uh, we will seek legal advice on that. Yeah, so Thank I you. think that, that that's important for that matter. I think, um, secondly, uh, we've talked about in the map that the chair and the vice chair submitted, docket 1216 and Councillor Baker referenced a little bit the, the, jigs, the jigsaw um, version, like kind of look of the lines. Um, and we are talking about the increase 
in communities of color in the population and the voting age of communities of colors now making district three um, under this map a um, opportunity district but i'm really curious about what the actual voter turnout is here because we could be talking about you know we're increasing the percentage of people of color in this district by x percentage and then we're talking about 100 votes and when we talk about voter dilution or you know there, there's another section here in the analysis of discriminatory results that talks about the majority must vote sufficiently as a block to enable it um maybe getting some legal clarity around that but i why I would like to formally request the voter turnout for the precincts that are going from District 4 to District 3. So you want the voting history for uh, District 4, District 3? The precincts Those that pre on docket number 1216, there are one, two, three, four, five precincts that are moving to District 3. I would like to request the voter yeah, turnout. Certainly. For Excellent questions. Uh, Doctor, um, sorry, I'm just giving you a new title, yeah, no. Doctor Councillor Morel. Uh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, I was just saying, you know, to, to Councilor Lauer's point, um, I think we should do that to all maps uh, to make sure that voter dilution is not going on against any proposed maps. Um, so I think we should do that mm -hmm. question for all proposed maps to see where we're at now in terms of uh, people of color votes and how we're diluting or if we're diluting on any of these proposed maps. Yeah. So are you making, is that a, a formal request for yes. Councillor Murphy and Councillor William Anderson to no. make a list of the precincts that they're switching? We wouldn't necessarily have any of you, you know, we, we, we would have someone do the analysis and, and looking at voting voting history and uh, voting patterns for all, all the maps would be useful. And again, to your point about the uh, political cohesion of the different uh, uh, we, w we will ask that question as well. Great. The other question that I have is that in um, Councillor Baker's historical um, presentation, he talked about defining the core of a neighborhood. And I think we oscillated a little bit between kind of like cultural cores of a neighborhood and the physical geographical core of the neighborhood. And I just wanted to uplift that the Voting, right, the Voting Rights Act talks about maintaining the core as a geographical core, meaning that we cut um, along. And, and Councillor Baker did reference that a couple of times, but then um, we kind of went into talking about cultural cores of neighborhoods and the referencing of like Nubian Square, and so, which Nubian Square by happenstance is also at the geographical center. Um, but in the conversation about the parishes and so on, just wanted to, for the record, um, make clear that the voting, that when we're talking about maintaining cores of districts, that we're talking about the geographical center and not cultural cores of the district. Um, I really appreciate the thought that has gone into considering the communities of interest, particularly in Dorchester, but I really, um, I, and I guess my question is about what are we considering secondary, right? The Voting Rights Act um, really calls on us to look at racial and language minorities and communities of interest because they can be defined as basically anything um, are secondary to that task of empowering um, communities of racial and language minorities. and so. As historical as parishes are, they're not, you know, and, and, and can be considered communities of interest, absolutely, um, both culturally and religiously. Um, they are secondary and tertiary to what we're trying to do here. So we also keep going back to the forward projecting conversation. There were at least six comments made about the forward projecting conversation. We have we removed it from the principles because we are not allowed to use the forward projecting conversation. And Senator Diane Wilkerson you know, very clearly stated for us in her um, testimony that, you know, she, she believes that we removed it from the principles but didn't remove it from our minds and here we are having yeah. a conversation about the projections. So just, again, if there is an argument to, counsel, to, to Councillor Baker's point, if there is an argument that can be made legally that we considered forward projection, they would be able to use our recordings to say that we are considering them, so just wanting to be careful about that. We are not considering forward projections. Thank you. It's um, the reality of the situation. We do not consider forward projections. Thank you, Chair. And I think that those are all my questions and comments for right now. Thank you. And we'll, we'll submit your questions to the legal, legal counsel. What are we doing? Um, anyone else got any questions or comments? Oh, Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, and I just want to note that, you know, we're dealing with uh, real population increase in District 2. 
that, that's that's the crux of a lot of our like the a lot of the issues with this map is that you're up 13,500 people in District 2. And so I've heard a lot of mention about legally defensible or compactness and all of these different things. This is a legally defensible map. Uh, this is entirely legally defensible. From the Voting Rights Act standpoint of trying to make sure that you're ensuring uh, racial communities have an opportunity, this map does that. But on top of all of that, if you were to attempt to do, say, nothing with District 3 and the north side of this map, you would then essentially have to send District 3 into one of two districts. You would have to send District 3 into District 4, or you would have to send District 3 into District 7, because District 3 has to grow under all variations of this map. And District 2 has to, has to shrink under all variations of this map. Doesn't matter whose map it is, District 2 is gonna have to shrink, District 3 is gonna have to grow. And so at the end of the day, what you're really talking about is if District 3 were to somehow go into District 4 or somehow go into District 7 to avoid going into District 2, District 2 can only shed votes and shed people into District 7. There's, there's nowhere else for it to go. It can't go into District 1. It can't go into District 8. There's only two places it can go. It can go to District 3. It can go to District 7. It can go to some combination of the two, but it only has two places it can go. And at the end of the day, if you're trying to split up, say, South Boston and the South End, South Boston is only touching District 3. So the South End is touching District 3 and District 7 already. And so when you look at this map, it actually does all of the population growth factors. It follows all the Voting Rights Act principles of making sure that we're uniting communities of interest, making sure that we're empowering racial minorities. But it also makes sure that we keep as whole as possible the cores of these constituencies. It still is a Dorchester majority district. That does not change. It simply adds the South End, which it already has. And the truth is, any other variation of this map is gonna require drastic rewiring of District 4 and District 7. One of the issues uh, that you have brought up, Chair, is the fact that you have precincts that are like 6,000 people. The problem on the south side of this map is that these precincts are incredibly small in some places. They they're sometimes have less than 2,000 people in a precinct. So if you're trying to make up that, that district, you're actually geographically taking more territory going one direction than you are going in the other. And so you end up with these, and I encourage people to try and to do this at home using the, the wildly available District R map. What you're gonna find is District 7 gets changed incredibly so. District 4 gets changed incredibly so if you try to do anything but send District 3 up north. Every map is gonna have to do that because frankly, if you don't do that, District 7 will not look like District 7 anymore. District 4 will change and the problem, back to the racial demographics of all of this, is that District 4, frankly, and I think it's it, the Voting Rights Act sort of is clear in this, cannot pack more people of color into it. It has to become a, a more white district. And so if you were following that, then it really can't go into District 5 because the precincts handling sort of the borders of that are majority people of color and it's not close. And then if you go into District 7, that's almost entirely majority people of color in the, in the presiding precincts. So in order for that shift that was discussed of District 3 sort of taking more into the south of District 4, what you're doing is then you're forcing District 4 to pick up people of color out of District 7, or you're forcing it to essentially pick up people of color out of District 5, which impacts the way that District 5 is as an opportunity district, which was the major fight in 2010. But it also impacts District 7's lines because it would weaken their person of color, because in order to do that, you have to take District 7 and send it up through the South End, which would then make it significantly wider and, re and reduce a lot of those population changes that just can't happen. Yeah. And so so I recognize that there is a sort of back and forth about what, what geographic parts of a neighborhood should be untouchable or just whole, but there's a practical reality, which I respect that Councilor Braden and Councilor Burrell, you both are aware of, we put maps together. These precincts, once you move one, you're moving other things too. Yeah. You just have to do it. And the fact of the matter is District 2 
is the linchpin to almost all of this because it is so far over and it can't give those precincts up to District 1 and it can't give those precincts up to District 8 and that only leaves District 3 and District 7 and you get into a place where even if you gave it to District 7, you're then wiping out sort of the bottom of that map. And so we have practical realities beyond all of this that I think need to also just be understood because I, I would love to daydream about perfectly rectangle or square precincts and districts but we don't have that. A lot of these precincts on the bottom of this map don't make any sense. They're geographically drawn up from 100 years ago. Yeah. And so there's no, there's no, like this was farmland. And so from the standpoint of what these precincts look like, they don't make a whole lot of sense. I, if I had my, my wherewithal, we would have made perfectly shaped precincts, but unfortunately, just like our streets, that's not how this works in Massachusetts or in Boston. And so we have this map, and the reality is, we can talk all day about, I want a perfect square, or a perfect rectangle. Nothing looks like that. And if you look at District 3 on our map, it looks very similar to District 8, which does the exact same thing. It goes all the way from Mission Hill all the way up to Beacon Hill. You can't convince me that Mission Hill and Beacon Hill have the exact same kinds of community needs. I would say that if Councillor Bach were here, she would tell you they don't. And so this argument that somehow a district has to be 100% geographically centered or 100% uh, economically the same or however you want to try and deal with that, no district should look like that because no district does look like that because unfortunately that's not how the city is crafted and we do have a mandate to ensure that through the Voting Rights Act we are creating racially diverse and racially competitive maps and that really does require that District 4, as at least two of the three maps before us, absorb some of District 3 and that District 3 move north because that's where the numbers dictate it. Now we can argue about how much north or how much of District 4 to District 3 it has to acquire, but that is, that is the reality of what these maps do. And I, I, I think you know we have six weeks or whatever it is to get this done, and I think it's important. Three that, weeks. Well, three weeks, that's good. We cut it in half. Uh, but I think from the standpoint of where we are, I don't think we're that far away no. between any and all of these maps from getting there, but I do think that we have to sort of just accept uh, as a body that nobody's gonna love all of the lines of a district because you can't, because the way in which this map is changing due to population shifts is different. And I would just also note that 1983 and 2022 to 2023, really different city. <laughs> it's very, it's different. very different. And so from the standpoint of, you know, what people were thinking about in 1983, I don't think that's nearly as important as what our geographic lines and our actual population lines are saying we should be considering. I know my family in 1981 was one of the very first families, I think you could count them on, single, on one hand, of color in, in what would become District 5 in 1983. And now you would, that's, a, that's a majority person of color district. And so the geographic lines and, and the ways that people are moving and living in different parts of the city and what they represent, I think is, it's important to have a historical context, but I would also just note that the geographic data and the, and the fact of the matter is the racial data of all of these areas has changed over time. People have moved, people have changed. You have new generations of immigrants and new people buying homes. and so. Uh, I appreciate the work that everybody has put in on creating maps, but I think that it's important as we move forward in this three-week span that if people are suggesting that we sort of do one thing, I think it is important that they also sort of note what exactly we're supposed to do with that part up north because ultimately you can say you want one thing or you want another thing. I certainly, even on the map that I presented, there's things I, I wish I could change. I just, this is what it is. And so from the standpoint of going more north or going more south, there is a ripple effect that I think it's important that if people are talking about or making suggestions that they have a suggestion as well for what happens on that other half because otherwise we're just throwing out wish lists yeah. of things that can't happen. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo, and uh, you know, sadly, we don't have a whole lot of time to discuss this. And times passed. It took they deliberated on these issues for a good eighteen months, um, and I think you know we're really just getting into this very important conversation in a very short timeline. So, I, I also welcome like the folks that are watching, like we, your comments, your uh, critique, your. Um, feedback is all very important, so we encourage uh, uh, f folks to weigh in on this and, and share their thoughts on this very important uh, discussion. 
Um, Councillor Lara, you're next. Thank you, you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make a comment um, responding to Councillor Arroyo's um, statement about this particular map and specifically about the fact that District 2 needs to shrink and District 3 needs to grow and about the direction in which that growth happens because I think that, and President Flynn um, mentioned it, I think you know for, for the first time since we've been in this process, that there's an elephant in the room that people are not mentioning and it's that nobody's gonna cut into South Boston. None of these maps do it. Nobody's gonna, so, like th there's, the, you. you you might be suggesting that we cut into South Boston, but the reality is that that we're not going to break up that neighborhood. I don't want to be in that blender, and you know, good luck. And I don't want to speak for Councillor Flaherty or Councillor Flynn, but good luck getting them to go to go back to South Boston and saying, "Hey, hi, we've broken up the the neighborhood." And so that is like I, I just want us to be honest about the fact that like we're we're moving in one direction here because we know that that there is like a, a a direction in which people are unwilling politically to move into, to move towards, um, and that we shouldn't. I don't want to be in that blender. Don't put me on the list of people who are going to have to tell the people of South Boston that I voted on a map that cut them up because I'm not going to do that. Um, similarly, how I wouldn't do that with JP because you're just, there are, like like Councillor Baker said, people want to keep their, their neighborhoods together, and so that does put us in a precarious spot because the council has to vote on this map, and that means that we have to get two seven votes, and if you can't get seven people to vote to go in one direction, then we have to go in the other. Um, and I just want us to be honest about in what direction it goes into, knowing that District 4 and District 7 are black um, and people of color districts that we shouldn't be cutting into there. If District 3 and District District 3 needs to grow and District 2 needs to shrink, if we want to keep things simple, then what you do is you swap between D2 and D3, which means that we go into the South End. It's like we're talking about simplicity here. We're like, we should keep it simple. That is a simple thing. There is a district that is next to each other. One of them has to grow. One of them has to shrink, flip, flip the, switch the precincts, go into um, the neighborhoods. Um, so just wanted to put that out there for the record. Thank you, Councillor Lara. We will take that under consideration. We, um, we always have that delicate balance to try and preserve the community, the, the district, opportunity districts that we have. We've got four right now, and uh, diluting the population in any of them uh, significantly would, would change that calculus as well. So that's another consideration. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. You. Just continuing on, on that same uh, theme from uh, Councillor Lara, and I guess probably more of a challenge uh, to, to the map makers. Uh, you and the vice chair were able to take a look at uh, and put forth a map that had 18 precincts uh, changing districts. Our colleague, Councillor Murphy, I think is in around the same 17 yeah, so. districts. So I guess the challenge through the chair to uh, the makers, uh, both Councillor Royo and uh, Councillor um, Fernandez Anderson, do they have the ability to do a little bit of a deeper dive on their map and try to see if uh, they could come forth with something that um, doesn't have as uh, theirs uh, moves disrupts 25 precincts. Do we have the ability through that map um, to bring it in in line with you at eight? You guys are at 18. Uh, Council Murphy's at 17. They're at 25. So I guess through the chair to the makers, maybe a little bit of a deeper dive to see if they can get um, sort of their vision, their plan, of, and their map to get into that sort of that 14, 15, 16 precinct changing districts uh, which might you know that might get us so maybe to a little bit more of a palatable location between the three maps thank you um councillor flaherty um councillor royal any response to the notion that you might be able to modify your map to reduce the number of precinct changes yeah and what i would say is our deviation is the reason why we we did that i think you know in terms of uh the bpda's deviation uh which is a little different uh, in terms of what it looks like. Ours is 2.55 across the board. And in terms of just what we went for here to answer sort of two things that were brought up is the idea of cutting into South Boston uh, is off limits. I mean, I would have cut into South Boston if I thought that was better for the District 3 creation of an opportunity district there. But what I saw here was an opportunity to make whole a neighborhood that had been asking to be made whole and has never been whole to any serious extent. And so the additional precincts that we're talking about are really precincts that go towards making whole the South End. 
if you don't make the south end whole, then you can leave more of it in District 2, or you can leave more of it in District 7. But the reality is, when you look at this map as, say, opposed to uh, uh, Councillor uh, Braden's and Councillor Worrell's, or this map in relation to Councillor Murphy's, I would argue that ours keeps more neighborhoods completely centered. I mean, in one of these maps, you're splitting into Jamaica Plain, you're splitting into different neighborhoods, you're cutting up through Roxbury in some of these maps. The, the reality is our map did the very best it could to keep places whole. And I would just say that, that in terms of our mandate, I don't see our mandate as not changing, you know, changing as few precincts as possible. I see it as creating the best opportunity districts that we can create while also trying to maintain uh, as close to, if not better than, 5% deviation on the map as a whole and trying to respect sort of neighborhood boundaries. And I think we can get into a lot of stuff about, you know, Dorchester is massive here. Dorchester has, in, in essence, I think three districts touch Dorchester, uh, but it, it's, it's essentially split between District 4 and District 3. And Dorchester, as I've always heard about Dorchester, is north and south. And in our districts, it's east and west. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that foundationally that it was created that way from 1983 on. Um, and I, I don't know how much of that actually has to do with Dorchester Ave and how much of that actually has to do with not putting a black population into District 3, to be honest with you, historically. And so when you look at this map, yes, it has more precincts by, I don't know what the total difference is there. It's like seven or six. What is the total difference? Seven, and then I don't know what the amount of changes on the Murphy map are. 17. 17. So it's about seven or eight. But I think you'll notice that almost all of those precincts, and when you get down to it, come from the south end because we move more of those. That technically is a flip. Uh, and so there's a lot of precincts that get flipped, but yet we somehow keep a vast majority of these districts the same. I mean, if we didn't take 310 from District 1, from District 8 to give it to District 1, sure, you could count one off there. That's the West End. It, I think both Councillor Bach and Councillor uh, Coletta have said they're fine either way with what happens to the West End. They both think it makes logistical sense. But there's very few places where I think the variations make a whole lot of sense. And, and part of the issue is we do more uh, in a lot of ways on that bottom half of the map than the top half of the map. And if you look at those precinct populations from the top half of the map to the bottom half of the map, it's it's incredibly dense in the top north part. So I would just say I haven't seen sort of our objective as the lowest amount of precincts that move or change place, but more so trying to respect neighborhood geographic lines while also creating uh, voter uh, rights act eligible maps that actually increase diversity and increase uh, the people of color populations that the voter rights act sort of says should be put in places. We also saw it as an intentional attempt to make communities of interest like the Vietnamese community and the LGBTQ community more prominent in one district uh, so that they can have a unified voice in that way. But, you know, I think all of these maps we can quibble about precincts, and I expect nobody's map will get through this entirely the same. Uh, and so I, I think we can look at where and how we might change things, but I just would say the deviations is what makes that difficult. If you change one here, you might have to change two here. There's a there's a ripple effect to every change that gets made or doesn't get made, and one thing I would just say is we have much more equal uh, districts in population size than the chairs map that does leave some of these populations seven or or eight thousand or six thousand less than other populations. It tries to do the minimalist amount of change while still sort of being legally defensible and and being a map. And I thought that would sort of undershoot what we should be trying to do from an ambitious standpoint uh, of trying to create something in line with the mandate we have from the Voting Rights Act. So uh, hopefully that answered that, but I'm happy to have further conversations and working sessions about where and what precincts you have in mind for that goal. Thank you, Councillor Royal. Um, Councillor Murphy, you're next. And then I'll, I'll take Councillor Fernandez-Anderson, then Councillor Mejia. Okay. Pardon? Oh, you're blinking. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll stick to and then Councillor so, Baker. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. I, I, my peripheral vision, vision seems to be deficient these days. So I know it's hard to see around the whole room because we're thank not you. at a table for this working session, I understand. But I do know I pressed my button back when um, after Councillor Arroyo had spoken about the look of the precincts. So I know my light's been on, so thank you for letting me speak. And I do have a few things because other things have been brought up that I want to make sure I address. 
So um, first, we know that District 3, well, so the research that I did, which we did a lot of research, um, one thing I know our office feels coming out of this um, exercise, we will end up with a map, yes, and that um, I learned a lot about our city and about the history of it. And I said this when I first spoke at the beginning, that besides District 9, which is Alston and Brighton, District 3 has always been the only district that is only made up of one neighborhood of Dorchester. That District 4 was the other side of Dorchester, the Blue Hill Ave side, but also needed and always had Mattapan, Rosendale, Jamaica Plain. So, and also District 4 has, when you look at it historically, it's on that spine of Blue Hill Ave and all of those wonderful communities and neighborhoods around there. And for decades, we have been able to elect strong people of color out of District 4. We had Yancey for a long time. We have Andrea Campbell. We now have Council of Worrell in District 4. So, and District 3 has now and has for a very long time been a major, minority majority. It now currently without any changes is 72% minority. And many of the changes that my map is proposing would bring more minority into District 3. The um, talk about the look of the precincts and the sizes, I have to push back a little, like growing up there, knowing, living in this part of the neighborhood, many of those are like real boundaries. Cedar Grove Cemetery, the bridge to Milton, the bridge and Neponset Circle that brings you into Quincy obviously has to be a break no matter what. Port Norfolk that's been you know, out behind Tenney and Beach we have many different boundaries in that neighborhood that make the reason why they split. If it's Dot Ave, if it's Granite Ave, if it's actual the Atlantic Ocean that's stopping it from moving forward. The other thing I wanted to address, something that Councilor Lara brought up, is she had said that there is um, the elephant in the room. Someone who's an at-large counselor who does need to get votes from all districts all precincts across the city in South Boston where I get many of my votes support. I was, my map does actually take two precincts, seven five and seven six out of district two. So it's not true that none of the maps proposed was afraid to. I was brave enough and did knowing that district two probably wanted to add the, seven, the precincts in districts in Ward 7 that they lost 10 years ago. But I proposed it this way, knowing that to keep Chinatown and to keep the South End and the other neighborhoods like Villa Victoria and others intact, that you would have to take from somewhere. We know that Councilor Baker, I'm sorry, District 3 needs to shrink. We know that District 2, I mean, District 2 needs to shrink. We know that District 3 needs to grow. I don't believe it needs to grow in the north. I do believe that we could combine, and my map does, bring Lower Mills back together. It also brings the Vietnamese community, Little Saigon, which is a strong business district now together. Those precincts are combined, 16-1, 16-3, 17-14, 17-13 are currently split. Lower Mills is split in the current make up mine would combine them and we could also move up like Councillor Baker was suggesting to add more of that area below um, you know near the Dot Ave, St. Gregory's, Kearney Hospital, Walsh Park, not sure like whatever we want to call it that neighborhood that sits across from the Kearney Hospital and near Galvin Boulevard would be a very cohesive boundary there. So those are, um, just wanted to mention those things. I think that's all that I had to say for now, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Who did I say was next? Councillor um, Fernandez Anderson, I, I'll give you the floor. Uh, Madam Chair, I think that Councillor Mejia has to be somewhere. It's okay if she goes first. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mejia. I'm sorry. You have the floor. I'm Councillor Aaron. Did, okay. Oh no. Councilor Mejia. I, no. She just said something under her breath. So I was sorry that, yes, I understand we all have to go, Councilor Murphy. Um, but um, I just, before I say something, I want to address something. 
We had a meeting around rules and decorum and how we show up here in this council chamber. And I'm going to ask my colleagues that we abide by those principles. And, count, and I just wanted to address right now that um, Councillor Murphy's comment underneath her breath is not part of the culture that we want to create here. And I just want to name it and publicly let just know that it's not good decorum. But um, I'm going to talk. So one of the other areas that we're not addressing here in terms of the elephant in the room is um, to, for those who grew up here in the city of Boston um, during the height of the busing era and the racial disparities that existed here in the city, we have to be super mindful that as we continue to talk about what's going to happen in the next 10 years, that we don't find ourselves harping on how things used to be, right, um, in terms of the racial situation. And I feel like a lot of the areas that my colleagues are bringing into the chamber were very racially and segregated um, and really uh, did not embrace communities of color. So if the goal and the exercise is for us to move forward in an equitable way, I just think that we need to just be super mindful of staying here in the present um, because bringing into this conversation um, neighborhoods like Savin Hill, to my colleague's um, reference, was very different in 1981, 1982, 1983. So let's just try to remain focused on the here and now and the racial makeup of the city that we're living in today. That's the only thing that I'd like to offer as we continue to move through this process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Thank you for your comments. Um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Mejia has to leave. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Councillor Murphy. Before Councillor Mejia leaves, would you like to respond? All right, then it's my turn. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I I had a question actually about something that um, you mentioned, Councilor Murphy, just for clarification. Can you please um, enlighten me what exactly did you mean by the parish or that community being the strongest standing community? When you were talking about the um, parish, um, you mentioned that as in terms of communities of interest that it was the strongest standing community in Boston. I never said there was a parish that is the strongest standing community in Boston. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't need to argue that if I, um, I don't, um, it's on tape. It's okay. It I so just want, I, I wanted to understand it. Sorry? I'd appreciate it. We should Excuse watch me? it together. I'd like to, to see. So I could explain it. If the someone history. else can explain it, if they heard it, I could talk to it. No, no, just, I didn't want it to understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, now, in terms of, um, Councillor, Baker in your statements about the map, I wanted to ask you um, in, in, in the interest of time, when do you, will you be proposing something and when do you think you will be proposing something? I can come up with something Monday. Monday? Um, really interested in seeing what, um, in terms of what we are supposed to do here. Could we please address the questions to the chair and we'll, oh, we'll answer them soon. Uh, Madam Chair, my apologies. Uh, so, you know, put the question out and, and if we'll ask Councillor Baker to respond when. Uh, through the chair, um, Madam Chair, uh, if Councillor Baker can, um, I wanted to know when he would give the map um, so that we can look at it. That was. That was that point? Okay. Um, and then in terms of our map, I mean, I think that Council Royer did a good job breaking down what, how, why we can't go north and in terms of going to the left and uh, to the districts that abuts Council Baker's districts, going into Roxbury or splitting up Roxbury to increase uh, communities of color um, into Council Baker's district or going into District 3, I think I mean, practically makes the most sense, but at the same time, 
Um, there's some arguments there about what Council Baker feels needs to remain cohesive in his district. Um, but again, wanted to reemphasize the fact that we, it, it, there was just two districts, major districts that needed change, right? So with mine being the, the third um, for it to change and then district four as well to increase a tiny bit. Um, and so we, we just didn't know where to go. And this is not, I keep hearing this again and again that it's, you know, it's intentional, that it's a target for district three. The target is the target. District two and district three happens to be um, the priority here and what, we, what needs change. So um, hopefully that we can continue the conversation without um, you feeling that it's a target. Um, I will take full responsibility. That was my doing. I thought it was a great idea. I thought that consolidating South End and bringing it to uh, that area without impacting communities that, are, that didn't need change, uh, District 3 needed change, District 2 needed change, then why not do it that way instead of impacting a community that's already together? Thank you. Thank. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez-Anderson. Councillor Baker, would you like to respond? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to respond to um, Council Mejia. Back to the principles, the criteria. Preservation of core of prior districts. That is because the more we move around, the more you get into, oh, we're in a, I'm an opportunity district, I'm a, an, an opportunity, no. I'm a community of interest, I'm a community, every place is going to view themselves as a community, as a community of interest. And, um, any way that I go, seven, six, seven, five, love to pick them up. And Lynch Homes, probably, probably all minority. Pick them up, no problem. The precincts down here, majority black. I, I'm trying to help you get to the opportunity district that you want, limiting the damage to District 3. I think that especially this map right here, you, to look at that and say that's not gerrymandered is us being disingenuous. And we can add a whole lot of good talking points. He's great at his talking points. Great. Fabulous. It's not a map that's going to that's gonna stand up. You know? So where would you like me to go? I'll take South Boston and stand in front of it and say to South Boston, I want to come and represent you. You know what I'm saying? We talk about blenders, whatever. I'll go that way. I think I have a lot more in common when I say I, I mean the district. I think District 3 has a lot more in common with those precincts right there. They would, they would, uh, be con they would connect with the Mary Ellen McCormick housing development. They would collect, connect with the Columbia Point housing development, which I have now. And again, how much are we, how much are we going to hurt District 3 to get three percentage points one way or the other? Um, so. That's, that's just some thought, thoughts. I can't help but feeling I'm the target just because of the tension that's around here. Um, gonna say it one more time to speak to the point over here. Preservation of cause of prior district. There's a reason for that there. We start spreading out all, we open ourselves up. I'm trying to help you. Thank you, Frank. Trying to help you both. Thank you, Councilor Thank you. Councillor Bacchus, do you mind if I take Councillor, am I taking anybody out of line here? Councillor Bach, uh, my peripheral vision is deficient, sorry about this. <laughs> Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. I first of all just wanted to apologize sincerely to colleagues. I, um, I had a long-standing meeting that I had to be at at noon, so I've missed the lion's share of this um, working session, and um, I am planning to watch the entire thing uh, afterwards, and I know sometimes we say that, but I really am in this case. Um, uh, so I don't therefore want to make like extensive comments because I haven't been here for everybody else's comments. Um, I did just want to, there were just a couple of things that um, I wanted to say on the record about um, this and sort of where I think we're, where we stand. Um, and, and then just a couple of um, remarks on a couple of things that folks said. 
Um, one thing I just want to flag that we're clear because people have talked a little bit about variation and how much the districts can vary. Um, and one thing I want to be clear about is it's definitely not 10 in each direction. 10 in each direction would get us to a 20 variation overall, which would be very similar to the variation that was ruled illegal in the 80s. So just want to be very clear that when we talk about 10, that would be the max of five one direction, five another. Um, and I think, you know, having read a bit more of that jurisprudence lately, you know, I think the really important thing for folks as we think about how different the districts are population wise is that um, it's not so much that there's any one number that demonstrates good faith, it's that it, de it actually depends on what the justifications for the variation is. Like if this council ends up with a map that is more varied in district size, but it helped us achieve opportunity districts and keeping communities of interest together, then you can justify the five. If you do five each direction and you don't have sort of justifying reasons that relate to the core goals of the exercise, then you're in jeopardy. So I would just remind folks that it's not just about a number. Now, I think that works in both directions. I know that I personally, in playing with these numbers, have you know tended in the same direction um, as, as uh, Councillor Arroyo and Anderson and Councillor Murphy's maps of trying to make that variation as tight as possible. But I do think that was some of the challenges that we're facing. It may be that variation is what has to give. And I think that's fine as long as we have good reasons that stand up to VRA scrutiny. So I just wanted to make that comment about variation. Um, the other comments I wanted to make is, you know, from, from my perspective on a, on a sort of VRA bar and data front, the dynamic that we face with the three maps, maps that we have right now is I think that on the face of it, there is a problem with the fact that Councillor Arroyo and Anderson's map swings District 3, 7 to 8 points wider. I think that that's something that because of the general desire to go towards opportunity districts is something that makes me concerned. Um, and I say that recognizing that the, I think, you know, the story about the LGBTQ district um, obviously is not a racial community of interest um, and, it's, and it's worth um, considering and talking about, but I just, that for me is the concern about, about D3 and that map. Conversely, my concern about Councillor Murphy's map is that it swings D4, three to four points um, more uh, black indigenous people of color majority and three to four points would not be huge necessarily if that map was down at a lower percentage, but because it's so high right now, because D4 is right now just under 90% to then swing it up to kind of like 93 becomes, I think, an issue. Um, so from my perspective, we have like these two guardrails we should really be avoiding in this process. One of them is swinging the total population of D3 wider, and the other is swinging the total population of D4 more towards people of color. Those feel to me like guardrails. For many of the reasons that have been discussed here, those are actually hard guardrails to keep. Um, and I think that, you know, to the credit of the chair and the vice chair, their map does stay inside of both of those guardrails um, and doesn't do either of those things. I think what we're all grappling with is that in avoiding doing either of those things, the chair and vice chair's map breaks up some communities of interest that we would all you know, rather see kept whole. So to me, the exercise ahead of us is how do we adjust so that we can keep more communities of interest whole? And recognizing that there are some things like, you know, I think actually all of these maps make that effort around the Vietnamese community, for instance, right? Like I think everybody's map has, has taken care of certain communities of interest that are split up today, but just at the cost of others. Um, and, and, but I think the thing that I would flag for colleagues, like for me as I'm thinking about this, is like if, if I had to choose between the three maps on the table today, I would choose the chairs and vice chairs for the simple reason that it doesn't bust either of those constraints in terms of a wider D3 or a um, more, uh, more people of color majority D4. Um, but I think the project has to be how do we get a map that is within those constraints, but maybe is able to hold some of the communities of interest more whole than the one that the um, chairs and vice chair, chair proposed. And I do think that for many of us who have done this exercise with tight variation, we might find some more options if we widen the variation. So that's kind of the um, direction that, that I'm working in. But I just wanted to put those comments on the record, recognizing that I haven't been here for the last 
an hour or so. And so just wanted to apologize again, Madam Chair, for that. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Thank you. Um, Councillor Flaherty and then Councillor Baker. Thank you, and I also just want to go on the record through the chair and thank um, our colleague, uh, Councillor Fernandez Sanderson, for her comments uh, in particular. And if we had, if you recall, we had our first sort of baseline discussions and doing the maps. And she was very gracious in terms of being willing to sort of accept um, uh, precincts. And we were trying to find a way to sort of navigate between District 3 having to shed and where some of those precincts were going to go. And sort of those first couple of meetings, I literally, because I've been through a couple of renditions of redistricting, and I finally was like, geez, this is going to go, this is great, this is going to go really smooth. And, and then, of course, uh, days after that um, comes the, uh, it was the Arroyo Fernandez Anderson map, and it kind of contradicted that. So I appreciate her comments and and willingness to sort of clarify that because um, uh, because of sort of where we stepped off, and then the map seemed to sort of contradict uh, part of the spirit of that. So that was important, and it, and it's also it doubles down on why I'm looking for, uh, and obviously look forward if if uh, our colleague Council Baker is looking to submit a map and to try to get that as soon as possible, so we can obviously take a peek at that. But for the map makers to date. Um, in, in that collaborative uh, collegial spirit just to sort of maybe double down this weekend uh, to try to sharpen the pencil to see whether or not we can again get to a point where um, to, our pre to the previous speaker's comments in terms of you know looking at those those boundaries looking at the communities of interest and, and all the, the, uh, the factors that go into what we're uh, required and mandated to do here but with this sort of, I guess, the least amount of uh, disruption, which is why I'm, I'm asking both you and, and, and uh, Council Rowell to sort of see if you can get under 18 precinct shifting districts. Uh, I'm going to do the same charge for Councilor Murphy to see if she can get under 17, and I've already asked the, uh, the makers of uh, the, um, the Royal Fitness and Anderson map to see if they can do, um, again, less than 25, and the same charge will be if we are getting another map or two or three to our colleagues, try to get them to us as soon as possible so we can get that dialogue and debate started, but also try to see what we can do to, you know, the least amount of disruption um, uh, per a district council with keeping in mind what we're, again, we're, we're being charged to do in the length of time that we're being asked to do it, I think would maybe get us to a sort of a, a place where we, we can maybe start to, to, um, to see some, uh, you know, I guess, uh, collaboration and uh, consensus, if you will. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Um, Councillor Fernandez, oh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Um, I mean, I, 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 I guess looking at uh, your map, Madam Chair, just asking for rationalization behind um, what happened between D5 and D4. Which one, um, D5? Your proposed map. D5 and D4? Yes. From the baseline? Yeah. From the baseline now, Jim. We, we, hang on, let's see where it is. Well, the one, the one was, oh, that's D3, hang on, the borders of D5 and D4. What are the shifts in that one? D5 to D4. 14, 15, 14, 14. So the idea behind that was um, one, um, we wanted to uh, make District 3 a more opportunity in district by increasing um, their black and brown voter popula um, population. And to do so, um, we had to pick up uh, larger precincts inside of District 3, which then um, requires us to move further, uh, further into district, district 5. Uh, to make sure that our population was underneath that 5% as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's the population numbers um, that required us to um, pick up 14, 14, 14, and 14 to 5, and also to make sure that we were um, moving in the right direction on in District 3 and District 4 when it came to um, 
people of color and increasing the white population inside of uh, District 4. And what happened to District 5? Can you break that down for me? Uh, I think District 5 in terms of, um, let me just double check. Uh, so we have, let me pull up the current. So it's very little apart from those two. Yeah, right? so District 5 currently is 73.3% uh, people of color. And then this variation. Makes it 70? Uh, I'm gonna take a look at it. Makes it, I have here, um, it's 27.1% uh, white population. So that's 73. So it doesn't really, I mean, based on my calculations, what I have here in terms of um, white population and people of color, it doesn't, doesn't affect it. Oh, according to the um, PowerPoint that you guys sent, submitted to us, it decreases it to 70%. So District 4, District 5? District 5. 70, I think it's 72.9 on that, on that population, right? Oh, so I think that's voting age population that you're yeah. looking at. I mean, practically, that's what we want to look at. Um, so then. Okay, I see what you're saying. The 2020 census on baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when you look at um, District 3, can you tell me how it's better? How District 3 is? Yeah, just sort of rationalize for me the changes that you made between 4 and 3. Okay, so what we were trying, what we were aiming at is that um, in District 3, right now I believe the numbers, let me just take a look at the PowerPoint. We are currently at 61%, um, and I think increasing, um, and I believe we are the, have the highest increase of um, uh, people of color um, in our map at 64.9. I, I believe that's the right direction that we want to go go towards in District 3. I don't think we want to go um, north um, of that number. Uh, so for, for us, we felt that increase in that number in District 3 is um, the right direction we should go. We should be increasing um, or strengthening uh, people of colors um, in, inside of that district. It went up by how many? 4%, uh, 4.2%. Voting age or just population? Uh, population and the voting age went up by Looks like 3%. Okay, can we compare that to um, Councilor Arroyo's in my, in my map? Mm -hmm. You got the comparisons there? I do not. There was, a, there was a question, um, and we're waiting for this. There was a question earlier about, um, no, sorry, I'll hold it to later. I'll hold it to the end, thank you. So we're gonna look at District 3? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, um, it looks like District 3 has 54.2% people of color in, um, in your proposal, where we have 64.9% people of color, which is 10% more people of color in our proposal. My biggest issue with your map is what happens between D5 and D4. Um, is there a way that we can redo that or think that through? I mean, these are all working maps, and that's why we're here to have conversations. Uh, so absolutely, um, if there's any ideas that you guys, that you would like to present, or Council Arroyo uh, would like to present, we are open to changes. Yeah. Um, like, we want to do this in collaboration, not only with our colleagues, but with the whole city of Boston. Uh, so yes, we are definitely open uh, to further discussions on how we can make amendments on these maps. By way, um, I mean, obviously through the chair, are we, do you expect a formal amendment submitted or just conversation? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, you could propose it um, through the chair. Um, is it okay to? Yeah, we, we're, this is still a working process. This is still a dynamic f working process. So if you have suggestions that you want to bring to the flow, bring to the conversation that we can look at, you know, at the end of the day, we want a, a map, a consensus map that the majority of this council, this body can, can vote on. 
So this is still a work in progress. All, all, not, notwithstanding the fact that we're on a very tight timeline, but yes, you know, if you have if you have a suggestion that and some and rationale, happy to consider it. Thank you. Through the chair, um, Councillor Baker, what's your feedback on the map that the chair and vice chair proposed for your district? I think the problem that I have with where they are on Dot Ave, the way it's, it's uh, that jagged edge there, I can do the same thing by picking up lower mills, all, all black precincts, heavy, vac heavy voting black precincts also. I believe 17-4 when, when I first ran was one of the higher voting precincts, all black higher voting precincts in the, the city. Um, I believe we, have, we achieved that and also um, going into the, the Ann Lynch homes, which um, that, that's all minority there also. I believe I add, I add uh, minority precincts doing that, keeping a much cleaner boundary. And the boundaries are what, are what lawyers are going to be looking at. You know, with Dot Ave being that, I know we, we, we don't, you know, it's a different city, yes, yes, yes. But Dot Ave is the spine of District 3. And that's, that, that is going to hold up. Dot Ave is the spine of District 3. I don't like this, the, the, the way that that comes through there. It's just, it, it doesn't look right. We need compactness, and it needs to look like we, we try to keep it as close together. And again, all black precincts, and if I go up to here, it, it, you know, the selfie guys aren't here, but seven. Seven, six, seven, five, Ann Lynch homes, Latino, black, probably Chinese. Thank you, Councillor. I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that we have a, we have a uh, time, we want to finish up today. Yep. Um, so, Councillor Baker, a um, couple, couple quick comments. I, I appreciate um, your comments around the variation. I think we have to figure that figure that out if we're if we're able to do a beer. someone might be heavy in their district someone might be light in their district I think we have to take that into account um, and also what Councilor the at large council from South Boston mentioned about variations precincts you know 17 18 25 over here question through the chair to to um, the maker of, of the the uh, this map over here for these 25 precinct changes. How many are in District Three of those 25? And then another question over here to the vice chair is: in between four and five, what is that variation there? Is that one precinct, two precincts? I think it's two. 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 And so the through the chair to how many of the. So a couple of things there was, I think we really got to look at the variation. Are we going to be open to variation? I think we should be, and again, going back to the points I've been, I've been consistent through this. We should be looking to do minimal changes. If we started 18 months ago, yeah. it's a different story. Yeah. But the reality is the way we're going now, what's, what potentially is going to happen, the feds are going to go and say, yeah, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, here's your map. Like it, leave it, it's your map. It's the same thing that happened during busing because the school committee couldn't get together on a real plan, so the feds came in and implemented. Yeah. Much and it's smaller our, level, but. Thank you, Councillor Baker. And thank it's our you. objective to get to a, a plan that we can get consensus on. Councillor. Uh, Councillor. Question on the floor. Uh, there was a question on the floor. Do you have uh, how many pre uh, precinct changes between? I would have to, four I would and have five? to look and. and make sure that I'm giving an accurate number. I don't have that off the top. Okay. Uh, but I, I can just say that the difference between, say, our map and the chair's map is that our differentiate, our deviation for District 3 has a population that's at 75,492, which gives it a total population of plus 0.56. The chair's has one that is point, negative 4.73. It's a 71,518. I believe it makes it the lightest district of all of the districts, largely in my opinion because it was very timid in how it treated District 3, but I just want to say that I don't, I don't have the numbers for that. I'm sure I can have them by the okay. next one. Yeah, and, um, and we, we're also going to have more, we'd love to have those numbers next time and we're going to have more further Yeah, that's perfect. Sessions. And then, and we'll do that. I, my question 
was actually uh, around the 10%, 5% this way, 5% that way. The BPDA uh, census data thing that I have here in front of me, that's the comparison of proposed redistricting plans, has the plan deviation range for the chair's map as 9.22%. Which is, which is much closer to that 5% one way, 5% the other way. I think a lot of that has to do with District 3, frankly, and the fact that they are so light in terms of what their population is in comparison to, say, Councillor Box District that I think on this map comes closer to. I mean, I, I don't have to guess. I can just go look. It has it at, on your map, it has the total deviation for, say, District 8. It's about nine. It's 78,000. It's almost 79,000. And then it has a 71,000 percent, a 71,000 population for District Three, and so clearly there's some room there yeah. for for changing um, that I think will actually bring the map from the chair more in line with our map in terms of how it it treats District Three. Frankly, I would also just say, and this is just an observation, the fact of the matter is, if I look at that map from 2002 that juts out into Mattapan that way. And then I look at the two maps presented by the chair and myself that just does it in the opposite direction. I don't, I don't really see any difference than what, other than just where we're sending the map to deal with the deviation numbers coming from District 2, it's the exact same geographical change. You're, you're going over Blue Hill Ave on one side or you're going over Blue Hill Ave on one side. So if you're saying, hey, this doesn't make sense, on, it, it looks jagged and, and not compact this way, but it doesn't look jagged and compact if it goes this other way. When it's the exact same sort of dimensions, I don't really fully understand that geographically uh, being any different. I'm, I'm sure it's different in population makeup and how that operates, but geographically, it's hard to argue that what that looks like and what the chair's map looks like, if you look at the 2002 map that has been made reference to multiple times, and then you look at the chair's map, it's basically the same thing. The only difference is one is jutting to the left and the other one's jutting to the right. That's, that's the only difference. And so I would just say, I don't think geographically it makes much of a difference in terms of compactness or not if it does do what the chair's map and my map does. Thank you. And I'll leave it at that so that folks Thank can actually you. go home and early. I know this is, a, <laughs> we're going to have a few more of these working sessions, so um, we have lots more to talk about. Councillor Murphy. I wanted to address what Council of Flaherty had said. So I do think in the information, the data I have that I will share will include this, and I already have this data, that the number of precincts isn't necessarily what we need to worry about because like Council Arroyo said, some precincts have 6,000, some have 2,000. So you can, the total number isn't important, so I wanna make sure that when we're sharing the changes that we have all proposed to different districts, where they're coming from, because what the data I have that I can share is where they originally were, which district they were in, which district they're going to go to, what's the population, but also including the demographic data also so that we can see. Because we can have three precincts that are smaller than one move, especially over near District 6, and there's some precincts in District 7 and 5 that are really big with large populations. So to make sure that we're including that, so it's because it's not apples to apples. And this, we have to get to a number. Yeah. So we need to make sure we're comparing. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. And again, I think our, our discussions are underscoring the need for um, more re-precincting in the city. Just to back up, but, um, there was a question earlier about District 2. Um, our map. The shedding of district, um, district 2 was shed into District 1, District 3, and District 8 without shedding into District 7. And I think the, uh, the objective from my mind was that we wouldn't further dilute the uh, community of colour um, and the uh, majority minority district in District 7 uh, to make it uh, less, less uh, to decrease the majority minority district. So that was part of our rationale. And I know this is, uh, we're, this is an ongoing conversation. I want to thank everyone for their participation today and thank you for all the work that you're putting into this. I appreciate it. it's intense, it's emotional, it is, but it's very, very important work. And I really do trust that as a, as a body and as a committee and as a body that we will get to consensus and that we will have a map that we will be very proud of at the end of the day. So thank you all for your work and thank you for being here. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>